morning, church. It's still morning. <sighs> New Bold Choir. Um, it's just been so beautiful. Your, the way that you sing, Sandra, it's just been absolutely gorgeous. I just had to take a moment to say that. What a blessing. Church, it's really good to see you all. Um, I've been away for a little bit. I hope you've missed me because I've missed your faces. Um, but it's really lovely to, to be back home. And it's really nice to see all your faces. Thank you for the scripture reading, Andrew. So it was a summer after I had finished my first year of university. And my friends and I decided that we were going to go on a little girly trip. Anyone else did that at university? Am I the only one? But there were two legs to the journey. We had to take two flights. Our first flight was amazing. We got to Gatwick Airport. The whole airport knew that we were going on holiday. We were really loud teenage girls, annoying everyone on our flight. And then we got to our destination, and there was a hurricane. And you can just imagine 19, 20-year-olds who are excited to go on holiday now get to the halfway to their destination, and we were like sad and miserable <clears throat> because this hurricane had come. We waited on the airport, which seemed, what felt like two weeks, but actually it was just a couple of hours. And finally, we got given an opportunity to get on a plane to our destination. And guess what? We got upgraded to first class. Can you just imagine 19-year-olds upgraded to first class? Well, we were doing way too much when we got on that plane. We took pictures of the leather seats, we took pictures of the champagne glasses, we took pictures of the, with the pilots. We got into the front of the plane and took pictures with the pilots. And back in those days, there were no, um, cell, there were no um, cameras, phone cameras, camera phones, you know what I mean. We had to do the old school, take a picture, and there were no selfies. So we um, encouraged all the airline staff to be our personal photographers, how irritating. As the girls, or the rest of my friends, continued to pose on the leather seats and take pictures of first class, I started to realize that everyone in first class wasn't as uh, appreciative of the way that we were carrying on. And I started to feel a little bit self-conscious. I realized I didn't really deserve to be in first class. I hadn't paid for the ticket. I hadn't, my bank account definitely didn't equate getting a first class ticket. I didn't have the right clothes. Some people know that if you have to be in first class, you have to have your feet covered. Well, that used to be the rule. My feet weren't covered. And I realized people started to look out the corner of their eyes thinking, well, are they a girl group? Because they definitely don't look old enough to get tickets in first class. You see, the people on the plane in first class would have preferred if we were behind the curtain, to be honest. They didn't mind that we were all going to the same destination. But traveling in the same class together, not so much. So since Easter, we have been looking at the cross from different perspectives. Pastor Andrew, if you can reflect back, spoke about the cross being God's um, self-portrait of his love for us. And then we had Pastor Jacques, who did our communion service, reminding us that the cross is the space where the past and the future meets as we commune with one another. And then Elder Stephen took us through how the friends and the family looked at the cross. And even though they betrayed Jesus at the cross, he still went to the cross and loved them. And today, we're going to look at the cross from the perspectives of the Gentiles. What if I told you that the cross posed a problem for one of the apostles? What if I told you that it was not easy for some of the apostles to understand the real power of the cross? That for them, there were two classes when it came to the cross. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Acts, and the words are from Peter. You'll happily turn to it again if you want to. And Peter was a Jewish man, one of the 12 apostles. We know him well. He was the one that denied Jesus, right? He was also the one that witnessed Jesus going to the cross. And now in the book of Acts, he is this amazing evangelist, preaching the gospel to everyone. But remember, 
he was still a Jewish man. And being Jewish came with a lot of baggage. And when I say baggage, I really mean a lot of baggage. Just like my auntie, who when she ends up at the airport for a two-week trip, looks like she's going to immigrate forever. If you were a Jewish person at the time of Jesus Christ, you had baggage. And this baggage had to be dealt with before the message of the cross could really be comprehended by the Gentiles and by the Jews. So let's look at this baggage. What could have possibly caused the apostles, including Peter, to have a roadblock in his mind to understand the cross fully? In the centuries before Jesus was born, you know, that period between the Old Testament and the New Testament where we have no word from God, it's silent as we call it, the 400 years of of silence, the Jewish people went through some ups and some downs. Mostly downs, if we were to be honest. So let's take a quick tour. You ready, church? We're going to take a little bit of a history tour. In the third century BC, the Greek superpower had conquered Palestine, and they tried to Hellenize Judaism. Can you just imagine what that would have been like? You have your Jewish faith, your Jewish culture, all the things that make you feel Jewish, and then you get conquered by the Greek empire. Things had become so bad for the Jewish people in this period that they weren't even allowed to practice circumcision. The thing that makes them Jewish, they weren't even allowed to do because they had been conquered by the Greeks. Things got even worse at that one point, the temple was desecrated. And do you know how it was desecrated? A pig was slaughtered in the temple. Horrendous, this unclean, profane animal slaughtered in the holy temple of God. Everything that had made a Jewish person Jewish was being ripped away, and this made the Jewish community angry. And you can just understand why. Their identity was being wiped away. How dare the Greek powers come into their land and take away the things that make them who they are? Eventually, the Jewish people rose up in revolt against the Greek, led by a member of the Hasmonean family, and they won their independence. And yes, once again, the Jewish people were were reigned and ruled by Jewish leaders. Well, it was good for a short while, but then power, as it always does, got to the Hasmonean leaders' heads, and it went from one extreme to another. The Jewish people, some of them felt oppressed by the new Jewish leader, and some of them felt liberated by the new Jewish leader, but there was a tug of war between what was the best way to do Jewishness. And then sex in the Jewish community started to be established, and we got the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essians and and the Zealots, and things just were messy. However, Once there was still this infighting between the Jews, the Roman Empire was being built up. And while they were fighting and bickering, the Romans snuck in and infiltrated the community. And guess what? A Roman client king was put in Palestine to rule the Jews once again. Do we all know the term divide and conquer? They became so divided that the Romans were able to come in and oppress them. So what is this history lesson I hear you asking your minds, Pastor? We came here for a sermon, I hear you. Well, there's a point to the little history tour that we went through. There were two really interesting things that happened in this period of Jewish history. And the two things that happened was that they became super patriotic as a community. Defending their identity as Jews became of primary importance to the Jewish people in this period because their identity, frankly, was always under attack. The effects of this is that their attitudes towards their cultic practices, the symbols that made them Jewish, became less about God, less about worship, and more about keeping culture pure 
and defending their identity. Do you remember in Isaiah 1 verse 13 when God says to the children of Israel, I don't want your sacrifices, I don't want your Sabbaths and your moons, your pointless assemblies. This is exactly what was happening. Because they cared about the symbols that made them Jewish more than God. So the first thing was that they became a very patriotic community. And secondly, in this period, their desire for a Messiah grew. Their desire for a Messiah grew. So how do we know this? Fortunately, we, in 1947, found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we get to see all these different um, pieces of text that tell us what happened in this period. And in this period, the Essene Jews, they decided that things were so bad that they couldn't keep their symbols and their, their culture pure. So they decided to leave and go to the desert because they didn't want to be with the confusion that was happening in Palestine. And they just didn't get on. Well, if you thought things were bad inwardly between the Jewish community, things were also bad in how they felt about non-Jews. They didn't like non-Jews very much either. And you can understand why, because for years and years, for centuries and centuries, they had been oppressed by non-Jewish people. And so even their ethics towards non-Jews were very, very questionable. Hear this piece of law that comes from the Talmud around about the time of Jesus. If a Jewish ox gnaws a Gentile ox, so bites a Gentile ox, there is no liability. But if a Gentile's ox gnaws a Jewish ox, whether the ox has a history of gnawing or not, full compensation has to be paid. You can just see that they didn't even feel that non-Jewish people had any dignity. It was almost like they were less than human. And this patriot patriotism led to a disdain for Gentile people along with anyone who sympathized with Gentile people. And this led to an increased longing and a desire for a Messiah. You see, while there was all this infighting, while they didn't like the non-Jews, all they wanted was for Jesus, well, a Messiah to come, to take them away. They were desperate for the kingdom of God to come. The kingdom of God was going to come and destroy all the non-Jews. There would be a bloody and brutal return, and the Messiah would be a warrior king that would be ready for battle. No longer was the Messiah a suffering servant, like Isaiah tells us. No longer was the Messiah the one that would come and deal with the brokenhearted or give liberty to the captives. He was no longer the Messiah who would refine the people of God and do the covenant work. In their minds, the Messiah was going to come and war with the non-Jews and destroy them because they were sick with the oppression they had faced. And this was the baggage of the Jewish person at the time of Christ. The understanding of God's plan for humanity, the understanding of a Messiah that they once had, was completely confused and messed up because of the years of social and political and cultural unrest. Because of what had happened to them by the Greeks, because of the zealous Hasmoneans, because of the Romans, they had become so super patriotic about their Jewish identity that they had forgotten their calling to go into the world and transform it. And instead, they retreated from the world and wanted the Messiah to come and destroy it. Now, this is not an anti-Semitic sermon. I thought I should say that considering what's happening in the news. The Jews at the time of Jesus are, were real human beings, not fictional characters from a fairy tale. The years of being under threat, the years of turmoil are seen in the frustrations and they started to embed themselves in the way that they saw God and the way that they saw the rest of humanity. It started 
the, the way that they had been, the way that history had, taught, had um, treated them, caused them to look and see life very differently. However, it's clear from the Bible that the biggest issue with the descendants of Israel was that they had forgotten their true calling. Being covenant people had a very clear job description. You are blessed to be a blessing to humanity. But by the time of Christ, this had been lost. And even after walking and talking with Jesus, even after Jesus had taught them so much, even after Jesus had died on the cross, they still didn't fully comprehend what God had really done by going to the cross. Why? Because the baggage of their Jewish past had shown up, shown up in the present and created a big, fat, blind spot. Even in the Apostle Peter. So when we meet Peter in the book of Acts, he is on fire for God. He is full of the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the good news to everyone. You can't, you can't get enough of gospel when it comes to Peter. He is speaking to the Sadducees. He is speaking in the temple. He's speaking outside of the temple. He is filled, so much so that when Peter is um, taken to a kind of court, a tribunal, he accuses the Sadducees of murdering Jesus. He is so bold and filled with the Holy Spirit. He was like an evangelist on speed. He couldn't share the resurrection enough. In my head, he's like Oprah Winfrey. Don't know if any of you guys used to watch her TV show. If you were an audience in Oprah Winfrey's um, show, what used to happen? Everyone would get a gift, right? You'd get a £1,000, you'd get a free car. Was I the only one who watched Oprah? Okay, okay, I didn't think so. She'd be like, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. Be like, yeah. And you could just imagine Peter, you get the gospel, you get the gospel. No, you don't get the gospel. Sorry, not you exactly, but you know what I mean. You don't get the gospel. And why would Peter be like that? Peter was like that because he had some baggage towards Gentiles. Everyone seemed worthy of getting the gospel. Everyone seemed worthy of the news of the cross. But you heard me right. Peter had a problem with Gentiles. Even though he was Jesus-believing, even though he was a preacher, he had a huge blind spot, simply due to the fact that he was a Jewish man. Like the majority of Jewish, his day, Jewish people his day, he wasn't a fan of, Jewish, of Gentiles. He had deeply held prejudice, which stemmed from his religious upbringing, from his social context, and from his poor understanding of the, Holy, of the Old Testament. This meant that Peter had forgotten the essence of what it meant to be a covenant person. Even having spent time with Jesus, even having experienced the gospel for himself with his own eyes, even being a person who preached the gospel, he too missed the central message of Jesus' death. And how do we know this? How did we know that he held deep-set prejudice? Well, it's in our scripture reading. Well, in the same chapter, Acts 10, verse 9 to 16. And please turn with me. And I'm going to read it out loud. Acts 10, verses 9 to 16. At about noon the next day, they, who the people from Cornelius, were on their journey, and they approached the city. Peter went up on his roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while he while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, mm, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again the second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. 
This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Was this to do with Peter's eating habits? No, right? Why would God give this vision to Peter? It was given to Peter because God knew that Peter had a massive blind spot and prejudice towards Gentiles. God used the vision to prepare Peter for what God was about to do next. God was going to use Peter, a very Jewish man, to share the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. What is interesting to me is that God could have used someone else, right? God could have found another means to go to the Gentiles. He could have found a Gentile person to speak to the Gentiles. That would have made more sense. They speak Gentile, right? But he chose to work through Peter, knowing that Peter would have to come, come overcome his prejudice that came so naturally to him. In fact, who could blame Peter for thinking the way he did. He was a product of his surroundings. He hung out with Jews. He only read Jewish texts. He was a Jew with a capital J. But God held Peter, the apostle, to a higher ethical standard. And he gave him the vision that would challenge his Jewishness to the core. God, I believe, is calling us all to a higher ethical and moral standard. He puts us in situations and positions that force us to make better and more ethical choices. Even when we feel extremely uncomfortable, even when it goes against what feels so natural to us, even when our prejudices are just a part of the way that we've been brought up, even when our prejudice is part of our poor theology, God sometimes, actually, more than often than we think, is calling us, just like he called Peter, to change our perspective for the work of the gospel to spread far and wide. The Bible says that after this dream, Cornelius' men appeared to Peter while he was still trying to work out what this dream was about. And who was Cornelius? Cornelius was a Gentile, right? The Bible says in um, chapter 2 still, in verse 2, that Cornelius... He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. He was a believer, but he also was a Gentile. So God speaks to Cornelius and he says, go and find Peter. Again, what is God doing here? Why doesn't God just let Cornelius continue to be a god outside of the body of Christ? Why does God find it so necessary to bring Cornelius under the banner of grace and into the body of believers? Because it's important to be community. It's important that even though we're different, we're under the same banner of God's grace. And so God does this to Cornelius and encourages him to go and find Peter. But in the meantime, God still gives Peter a dream, preparing him for Cornelius' men when they come. And by bringing a Gentile and a Jew together, God was about to show us just how transformative the cross really is. So Cornelius sends his men out to find Peter, and as they approach Peter, Peter is still perplexed by the vision, and God prompts Peter to let the men stay in his house. Church, this is unheard of. You heard me give you the history between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Staying in his house. He was more likely to put a tent up and tell him to stay in the tent in the garden, but come in my house and pitch up in my home. This was unheard of. As we follow the story that Luke tells us in in Acts, Ox in Acts, Peter decides to leave the next day and go to Cornelius' house. And when Peter meets Cornelius, Cornelius bows down and he's in so much um, joy that Peter actually comes to his house because again. This is unheard of. Jews and Gentiles do not mix. And then Peter even confirms this in verse 28. 
of chapter 10. He knows it's strange. He says, you yourself know that it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I shouldn't call anyone profane or unclean. This is massive. Centuries of bad theology had been passed down to Peter, and this had been overturned by the conviction of truth in Peter's heart. This transformed his attitude, and there was a total 180 in the way that Peter saw the world. And then hear what Peter says in verse 34, which is our scripture reading. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation who fears him and does what is right and acceptable to him. Peter realized at that point that Jesus wasn't just the Messiah of the Jews, but he was the Messiah of anyone who declared that Jesus was Lord. What Peter realized was that empty cross and the risen Savior declared that everyone is absolutely equal that everyone is playing on the same field, so that even Cornelius, a Gentile, and his family could be integrated into the family of God. So when this happens, Cornelius receives the gifts of the Spirit, and it's confirmation to the community that God has really integrated the Gentiles into the family of God. God wasn't about to let any prejudice, any historical or social or political issues stop God being freely available to everyone, including us, Gentiles. What the cross represents to the Gentiles, what the cross represents to us, is equality, equal access to the redemptive power of God. But you know, the story doesn't end there. Not everyone is very happy that the Gentiles are now part of the family of God. Do you remember the uncircumcised believers that gather? They hadn't dealt with their baggage. They were not happy that Peter was mingling with the Gentiles, and they were saying, what's going on here? They're not even circumcised. And Peter, in his defense, tells them the entire story of, of what happens. You know, I had this dream about unclean foods and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then Cornelius received the, the spirit of God and he, he got the spirit of speaking in tongues. And this arrested their attention. The disapproving Jewish converts, I can just imagine, were like, sorry, repeat that again. What happened? He received the spirit. They received the spirit. You mean to say that God is affirming and confirming that the Gentiles are brought into the body? And Peter says in Acts 11 verse 17, if God could give them the same gifts I have received, who am I to hinder God? Basically saying if God has accepted them, then who am I not to accept them? When they heard this, they had an epiphany, and they make this profound statement in verse 18. Then God has given them the repentance that leads to life. I don't think we always realize how massive the impact of Peter and Cornelius' reconciliation really was to the first century um, Christianity. If they had not reconciled, the Jerusalem Council also would not have happened. I'm not going to go through what happened at the Jerusalem Council in detail, but we know what the Jerusalem Council is, right? It's like the GC session of the first church, first century church. They come together to discuss whether or not circumcision should happen for those who've been integrated into the um, body of Christ. And Peter relates again what happens. And because of this, they write a letter to go with Paul and Barnabas and to tell the Gentiles that they no longer have to jump through the hoops of circumcision to be part of the community. This reconciliation totally changes the trajectory of the Christian church in the first century. The Jewish believers went from people, went from being people who had been culturally predisposed to being prejudiced, 
because everything they went through leading up to the era of Jesus, to a people willing to listen to God and make a way possible for Gentiles and Jews to worship together in Christ. What a witness this would have been to the rest of society. This Jew, these Jewish men were known, and women, sorry, these Jewish men and women were known as being people who prayed for the judgment to come and destroy the Gentiles. Now, through understanding really what the cross was about, they were able to share the gospel with the Gentiles and do community with them. When the cross was really understood, it changed everything for the Jewish community and the Gentile community. Jesus' crucifixion was the biggest equalizer the world had ever seen, and it still is. So what now? What challenge is there for us at Stambra in 2018? Here's the thing, church. Can I just be real with you? I just got really... Here's the thing, church. All of us, when we come to Jesus, come with baggage. Don't we? We all come with... Someone said amen, yeah. We all come with our stuff. All of us have a history. All of us have a background. Maybe some of us are like Cornelius. Some of us are God-fearers. We believe in God. We might even come to church now and then. Someone coaxes us that we should come, and so we come. But maybe we never felt like we belonged. Maybe a bit like me in first class when I know I shouldn't have been there, right? Cornelius was doing his thing with God outside of the community of the people of God. When we find him in the Bible, he is a faithful person, but for some reason, he didn't want to be part of the community. Maybe it was because he wasn't ethically, um, ethnically a Jew. Maybe it was because he didn't feel like he wanted to be circumcised. Maybe it was because there were just too many loops and hoops for him to jump through. Maybe it was because he fully understood that Jews don't really like Gentiles, and so he chose to stay away. And maybe there are some people in our community here today watching online who are like Cornelius. They love God, but just, you've just chosen to stay a little bit distant because you know what it could be like. But God still wanted him to be a part of the community. And God used a broken Jewish believer called Peter to bring Cornelius to the community. So maybe God is going to use a broken Stambra person with all our baggages and stuff to integrate you into the community. Christianity is not a nomad faith. It is a faith that requires community. And the cross calls all people to reconcile in Christ and start a new community together, a place where everyone is equal. And the community is flawed, and we have people do have blind spots, but God is still working in and with this community, so don't give up on it. God's Spirit is calling you into the community, maybe for this very reason that we need you so we can really understand what the cross is about. But some of us, maybe we are like the Jews, and we have very similar baggage to them. Maybe because of the past hurt, maybe because our history has made us a certain way, we too feel like sometimes we have to protect and defend our identity. But what if God is doing something similar to what happened to Paul and Cornelius? What if God is calling Cornelius to find us, but maybe we just haven't caught the vision yet? Let me just say that again. What if God is calling Cornelius to find us, but we just haven't caught the vision yet? Maybe God is reminding us today, through the cross, what the vision really is. We have been called to the body of Christ for the purpose of sharing the gospel in word and action. The cross, the cross is a reminder of God's faithfulness to his promise to redeem this world. Now let us take the mantle and do what we have been called to do. 
Legalism isn't the answer. Making signs and symbols of our faith more important than the people of the faith is where the Jewish people went wrong. Neither can we take the cross lightly and cheapen grace that is given to us. The cross calls us to a very high ethical and moral standard. It's going to cause us to become more disciplined by God's love. It's going to require us to be more like disciples. It requires much. It requires, it requires us to remember that we are called to be God's image bearers, a royal priesthood, says 1 Peter 2 verse 9. It requires us to do good in the world, Ephesians 2 verse 10. In accepting Christ, we are all on a flight, and we're all going forward into the future where God is going to restore us, thank God, and humanity and creation fully, when heaven will come to earth. But it's a flight with no classes. We are actually all in cattle class, if we were to be honest. We're all a little bit broken. We're all a little bit tatty. We all need God to deal with our attitudes, our ignorance, and our flawed humanity. But we're all in it together, equally in need of a savior, but even more importantly, equally loved by our savior.